If you sold out for Christ and you you believe in your heart that you work incredibly hard for Him, I got this word says we can live for work, we can live for the work that the King has given us, or we can live for the King. Only one of them reproduces life. So as you moving towards the end of man's calendar year, consider that because it seems to be already coded in. Take stock of how you pour out your life. You know, because the same instruction that Jesus gave to his disciples is the same ones that came to Jesus and said, Lord, Lord, we did this in your name. And he says, I don't know you. Know this, that obedience with what the king has for us to do reproduces life. Nothing else, not the work. And uh, on Friday, we had an amazing time together. For those of you that came, would have experienced that with the music and it was really beautiful. While I was standing there, there was quite a big empty space at the front. And uh, in that moment, God just dropped into my heart. Uh, Matthew 22, 1 to 16. And it was something that in the, in the physical, God ignited something in the spirit where he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged the marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Now I'm not referring to the event, please hear me. It's, it's around something of discerning the times and the seasons. I was specific in saying, taking stop for man's calendar year end, but it's not God's. If God has initiated some work to take effect, He brings it to close. Like, for example, the closing of the age. Only He knows when it is. And it's not going to be December 31st. Again, He sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, fatted calf are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. Those are two key components. What is it that we preoccupy ourselves with every single day? It's not in the work, but that's why the Bible instructs us, do everything as unto the Lord, that the work that is in our hands not become our our idolatry, our worship. And the rest seized their servants and treated them spitefully and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burnt up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, so this is the part that I believe for us in this new period moving forward. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, And as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. There's more to this, but I felt important to stop there. And the reason for that is discerning God's heart, which is to store and reconcile man back to him. We're living in that with a greater sense of urgency and importance. Amen. Don't you have a seat, please? Over time, I'm noticing that this that our hearts are being changed, and it's either being conformed more to the world or it's being conformed more into the image and the likeness of Christ. And if you're a believer, we are not exempt from this process. I would want to suggest not criticize, because again, it's, it's something of a spiritual observation. It's not something that I would want to be uh, misunderstood. Where a lot of churches have decided this year to close, which they've never ever done before. So there might be in that specific leadership in a specific church something in God of an instruction. It's not in the tradition that I'm talking about. But there is something that we cannot 
assume that circumstance has no effect on us. For almost two years, we've lived in a way where the church has had two choices. One, pressing to God, understanding purpose and significance. Or two, that what you do doesn't really matter. Whether you open or close, people are going to do whatever they're going to do. And, well, we can actually close. The church can continue with us not actually really engaging and pressing in. So nobody sets out, I believe, in making a decision like that with evil intent. But there is this real reality that it is not a time of rest, although we can rest now in this man season. God, I find, sometimes overlaps those things. But it is something of a gearing up. So even as we were coming into the season time, saying to guys, don't rest in the flesh, rest in God. Because 2022 is going to be something that God is already been busy with, but is ramping up in, the, in this new, new part to come. And I spoke a little bit about saying that we need to eradicate the spirit of offense. The reason why you would do that is because you frustrate your enemy's plans by interfering with those that need to carry out the work. So that when the king would say, let's go, you need to run off to go and sort something. Or, they, or the king, when he wants to call you, finds you hiding in a corner because you've made decisions that are anti-God. Safeguard our hearts specifically over this time. There might be few in this room, but you are the ambassadors of Christ. That when you hear people have picked up an offense or they've walked into something, that partners with the accuser of the brethren know that they've eliminated themselves from the work that God would want to do through them. So you can rush to them so that you might be able to reconcile them back to God. And so the reason why I share that is I'd like to kind of reiterate and massage deeper in the value of Christ and his birth around this time that we celebrated. It's been a number of years how we've seen even church attendance over Christmas, Christmas time has deteriorated and it's dropped and it's diminished as people are constantly more and more abandoning themselves from the faith. Even so, reconciling themselves to this, that actually I don't really need to go to church. That would have been in the final workings of what is transpiring. God's with me. So I understand Traditions of man in coming to church is futile. Coming to this place is just a building. We are the church. So as the church comes together and makes much of God, it is saying something. If you would consider Acts, how they moved and worked and walked out life together, it was identified by others, and that's where the first terminology of Christian actually came about. We are our own brand ambassadors these days. I hand you out a business card that says, I'm a Christian. But they cannot see that we are Christians. And that is something that we are working towards as a church, is seeing how the ex church never named themselves. The world named the church and said, these ones are Christ followers. Look how they cause a disturbance wherever they go. And that's a godly disturbance which brings about a change which is attached to a peace which surpasses all understanding. So there still seems to be a remnant of God resolving and dealing with the things that we have brought our idols into, um, our relationship and fellowship with him, which is something that he's giving us an opportunity in this time to eradicate. So the birth of Christ remains a key event in the history of all mankind. I would almost say this, if you had to speak to some of the young people today and you had to ask them about the Second World War and what its impact was on the world, they have got no clue. There would be the, 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 the grandfathers, there would be the uncles of the generations that preceded us that were still alive, that it was made much of to account to what actually transpired there. So as we, the, the spirit of this age is wanting to eradicate and numb any form of the real purpose of Christ, it is for us a real importance to actually uphold the birth of Christ as imperative and something that cannot be forgotten. We need to actually massage that in. Not about coming to church, but that Christ had purpose in his coming. 
So I want to just go to the beginning of how this all came about, because a lot of times when we look at the nativity plays, they focus on the specific Jesus coming and the condition, but they don't really explore the reason why he came much, except that they would be saved, which is vital, but the process, a lot of times we would hear people trying to work this out in their minds without running through a structured approach to be able to have the full picture. So this morning I thought we could tackle that a little bit. So first of all, we have to look at anything that is manufactured or made in the eyes of the one that made it. I gave an analogy on Friday and saying that White, if he draws a picture, it looks like a whole lot of lines. And then I say, oh, it's amazing. What is it? Vines. He goes, no, no, that's a truck and it's a bulldozer and there's you, mommy, and, and me. So where am I going with that is that everything that is created is in the eye of the one that made it. So we actually are going to God and saying, would you explain to us how it is that we are where we are today? So the original intent in God's heart can be explored in Genesis 1.27, which says this, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, and he created them. So you, you in society today are being uh, suppressed more and more that you can't even agree with God anymore. So this is why it's really important is that you have to have a stand. And one of the, the key components in this world at the moment which has been eroded even in the church, is that the Bible is questionable. If you have that in your heart, you need to get God to, God to get you to the place that that can be eradicated because you cannot stand on what you yourself have chosen not to believe as absolute. So I absolutely believe that the, the Bible is a historical document that helps us understand what happened, when it happened, why it happened. And the Spirit of God journeys with us to be able to interpret that and make it sense and make it relevant even in this day. So with this creation that we created in God's image and likeness, we are perfect in every way. Now as God gives us life to live, there's something with every promise comes a condition. In John 10.10 10, you can read, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy God's intent for all of us preceding the fall of man is that I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. If we take a look at Genesis 2, 16 to 17, it reads as follows. The Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So here you see God's intent is that we would have life and life in abundance. But with this, this promise of living this way, there comes a condition. And what is that condition? You cannot eat of this fruit. So understand the historical context of the kickoff of man. They're living in everything that Christ has restored to us, yet they never had the seed of corruption in them at this stage. So with this promise, there's always attached a condition. Here we see the accuser of the brethren for the first time come on the scene. Genesis 3 verse 5. Now this is an interaction between Satan and Eve. And he's enticing her to eat of the fruit. And she says, but God says we mustn't. And here's Satan's accusation against God where he says, for God knows that in the day you eat of eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This is really important because you and I always assume that we're very clever until we find out that we're not. Maybe it's just me that feels that way. So we would assume that this perfect specimen of a human would be beyond deception, but there's something that happens that what Satan does is he speaks in a way that comes to germinate a seed that in time it would grow. This is why it's 
imperative that we have the word of God. You cannot come to church on a Sunday, listen to me. Whoever your guru is on YouTube, Facebook, or whatever, God bless them. There must be this revelation that the Spirit of God in you is leading you and that the Word of God governs our life. If the Word of God cannot govern our lives, you cannot call yourself a disciple. Because this enemy that is there comes to sow seeds of accusation. And what he does is with this accusation that she believes, she becomes a slave. You are no longer slaves of sin, but a slave of righteousness if you've received Christ. But the moment that she believed this lie, she became a slave to sin. There can be no sin if there's no agreement. There can be no sin if there's no agreement. What the enemy needs us to do is he needs us to agree with him. The minute we agree, that's when we sin. Genesis 3, 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. There's a whole sermon on really poor leadership there, which we won't go into today. Because he was the one that God actually gave the covenant to and said, do not. So remember what we were talking about is the consequence. So often what the world does is they put God in this picture where he bears some measure of guilt because of man's choice. Why, if you say you love somebody, would you put this tree in the garden? That's rationalizing and reasoning because if you would consider that the opening statement that I made, the scripture that I read is, you are created in God's image and likeness. Satan has come in and he wants us to agree with some measure of accusation. Yeah, wow, he's been doing that from the very beginning. Why would you and I be exempt from that? There's no ways. So what he would want us to do is agree with God. So search your hearts out. Ask the Spirit of God. You cannot assume ignorance and arrogance that we are above being tricked into agreeing with Satan against God. So when I said there can be no sin if there is no agreement, Genesis 3, 6 says this. So when the woman saw... Oh, sorry, man, I've already read that. What I meant to go the next is sin reproduces death in us. So there was the promise or the guarantee is if you pursue this way, it would be disobedience. And the condition of eating of this fruit is it would reproduce death in us. If we would understand right in the beginning when he says he created man in his own in his own likeness, when Adam was conceived... Uh, not conceived, when he, was, when he had life breathed into him, it was the Spirit of God that was breathed into him that he would have life, and there was no corruptible seed in him. So sin reproduces death in us, Genesis 3, 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So if you would, uh, when you start getting sick, you don't know that you're sick. I mean, that's half the reason for these COVID tests, is you can't look and see, so we've got scanners and wands and probes, and, you know, we were always concerned in the 90s that watch these movies like E.T. with them probing or whatever. We do it so well to ourselves. We don't need aliens to do any of that. But what starts to happen is you, you'd be sitting with friends and you'd go, <coughs> I've got a little tickle in my, <coughs> you know, got a, <coughs> and you start getting the strepsils. And then you get the full on, <coughs> and you would say, I have symptoms which indicate that I am unwell. And into bed you go, and hopefully you've got somebody bringing you soup and rubbing your tummy and all kinds of things like that. <laughs> so what's happening here is there is a death that has taken place, soup. And I've used this analogy to say almost like at a DNA level, if you had a spiritual microscope, you'd be able to assess it and go, ooh, 
Sorry, this is not dead. Death is flowing in this person. And the evidence, the tickling in the throat, is what we see happen here. The minute that they did that, there was death in them. And so consequence of disobedience and sin invites judgment. And what was that judgment? In Genesis 3.14, so the Lord God said to the serpent, there's prophecy in, in this mix as well, which says, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go. Here's the prophecy. And you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I seem to have omitted it. But he goes on to say that you will, he will strike your head. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And that was the first indication for us of Jesus actually being the Savior. So there was consequence and protection and faithful future grace. So he drove out the man and he placed the cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So I've even heard some guys say, and God was so spiteful, he didn't want them to live. So he put this angel there. But if you would understand any kind of a normal medical thing, and Annika has done stuff in microbiology, and you will look in the microscope, there's evidence, as I mentioned, of something present that you would not want to continue because it would bring eternal death with no means of any form of salvation. So this cherubim that's guarding is actually grace, faith for future grace. Sorry, (laughs) my words escaped me. Too much uh, sugar yesterday. (laughs) Because by placing that angel there, it means there's a plan. If it's all lost, I mean, just go like this, you wipe it out, you start again. But if you have a plan, if you have something that of a faithful future grace, you can stop eternal life there because you know how you're going to secure it in the future. So this is where we would get to the redemption of man in Romans 5.12. Therefore, just through one man's sin, Adam, entered the world, and death through sin, and death, de- <laughs> you, and there's some uh, Clap with me so we can sound it out for me. <laughs> and death through sin and thus death spreads to all men because all sinned. Can you see how my analogy and the scripture are speaking a common language for us that we will be able to identify that when people are concerned about smoking and drinking as a primary source of sin, you can realize that death can only be loyal to itself. That makes sense. It doesn't matter what you're doing. That's what he was talking in the Bible about eating and drinking. He was saying it's what's in, what's in the heart. And the evidence of that is because a man is born dead, but that he can be saved from Christ, saved by Christ. <laughs> so this image that God gave me was that we almost would see this river of corpses and they just drop off into a waterfall, the abyss. So that's why I saw in our language in, in somehow trying to scare people to return to Christ. We've got God sending you, but he can't send you somewhere that you actually were already going. Because if I send Wyatt away, I also have the power to return him. But if there's a disobedience, an act that is done, you need somebody to rescue you. You cannot save yourself. So that is in this image that Christ comes and he stands in the water and as they believe what he has done, they start ascending and they start coming alive. Alive. (laughs) Let's get some water here. (laughs) We won't even try that one. I think it'll just come out, shh. So there was in the Old Testament this, if you would kill somebody else's brother, then they would come and they would kill your brother so that the the war would end. Otherwise, it's just back and forth. So there's something of these ways of living that have to originate somewhere. 
Because that was God's solution in the Old Testament. So here we see the very same thing. The laws that God puts in place for us, he is subject to them because he cannot deny himself. We vacillate and change, but the very existence of God, everything that we live in that is of good and in abundance, is the mirror image of him who created everything. So we see consequence in effect as a result of all sin being in every man that is born. We see this in Exodus 19, 21 to 22. And the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people, lest they break through to gaze at the Lord and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. The reason for that is when this death is now transferred from Adam and to every creation after that, this sin cannot be separated from man. So there's no ways that you could get close to God without actually just dropping dead. So that's where there were all these rituals and things putting in place so that God's efforts, if you are somebody that's law bound, you would see these laws for some kind of God that is a control freak and an authoritarian. But if you understand what he's doing is, although my people that I have created abandoned me, I have still pursued them and created every means possible so that I might be able to commune with them. Isn't that beautiful? So when you read Old Testament, read that in mind, because in due time, the promise, the one that who said that these things, he would embody all of them is yet to come, the birth of Christ. It was the beginning of the end. So when you're celebrating Jesus' birth, there needs to be this renewed boldness that it's not a baby that you're celebrating. It is the king that is coming for an eye for an eye. The death that came through one man is now through the death of one, the reconciliation of all men back to God. It's not an insignificant beginning of Jesus being born. And when they would say, well, why didn't God just fix it? Because God is the one that is holy and cannot deny himself. Therefore, sin demands a sacrifice. It needs to be appeased. It needs to be satisfied because God's holiness is not interchangeable. It's present continuous. So he's warning them, because of this that's inside of you, you cannot come close to me. There's a promise. The promise delivered. Listen to this carefully. Whenever a promise is due, persecution will ensue. This is important because you and I have been corrupted with a personalized gospel. Jesus loves you, which is not untrue, but it is not primary. It is a secondary. Because of the love between a husband and a wife, there's a child. It's the love that they have for one another that reproduces. So the love between the father and the son reproduces life. You and I become the beneficiaries. That is a paramount central focus of the gospel. That what transpires is saying that as Jesus is born, the promise is at hand. What happens? Persecution immediately. The reason why I share that is because the time and seasons that we're living in now is the precursor. There is the rumblings and the church has run off and has got all kinds of wild kick ideas but it's not rooted in the instruction. So you'll hear me preach a lot in the new year around being able to receive an instruction because we are not attached to a personal gospel, yet we have a personal invitation to be attached to the gospel. There's a very big difference between the two. Much the same way in your household, mom and dad live, dad leads, and as they're journeying this life out, the child is the beneficiary and they get to enjoy the life that you have set out before them. They do not get to determine it, dictate it, or else there will be corruption and no future. 
So what happens is as they're going through and they're doing all these necessary rules and laws and obligations, there is something that starts to happen, the promises to come, which we find in Luke 135. And the angel answered and said to her, now this is Mary that's discovering that she is the chosen one that has actually been prophesied about. And it said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. This is imperative. It is the cornerstone of how Christ's sacrifice can be perfect is because the corruptible seed is transferred through man and here the Spirit of God comes upon so that a child is formed absent of the seed of death. The world would want to try and distort this into some strange and weird, and that's because of the warped sin that is in man. But what is transpiring here is the future grace of all mankind is happening right here, right now. This is, this is the focal point of when you would see a baby in a manger. It's not a baby in a manger. It's the Son of God that is being birthed into what He has created. And it's the greatest expression of humility you could ever imagine. God is the most humble you would ever encounter. To contest that, you would have to try and argue how you being perfect and never being alone, because there's always been three in one, that you would abandon a unity that has never been broken for for what you created. And how can I say that it was abandoned or broken? When Christ was on the cross, he said, Father, why have you? That's a break. For what? For us. Because of God's love, the source of love. The reason why he loved us is not that we're so lovable, but he cannot deny himself. Therefore, we are the beneficiaries of this eternal love that can consume us and grant us a peace which surpasses all understanding. So I'll read that that finished, Luke 135. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So here's what I'm talking about, is that when a promise is due, persecution will ensue, Matthew 2.16. These are really significant events. So when people want to downplay what is happening, you must understand that is the enemy coming to sow seeds of discord to accuse. Because we do not have a real battle army tanks out there. Comfort and convenience is the enemy of the day. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, the wise men had come to inquire because they had been stirred by the Spirit of God, obviously, that the promised one was coming and they were looking for this new king. So he was exceedingly angry because they had this premonition or whatever that had experienced with him that they shouldn't go back to the king. And he sent forth out and he put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under. You can imagine that. So when we're talking about celebrating Jesus, this is no insignificant event. It was a game changer, and the consequence for the world was dire. I mean, they just annihilated all under twos. So the clincher, even though he shares no part in our guilt, he dies so we all might live. Romans 5.18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. So we look in summary in Romans 5.9, where we would see God's warning to them and saying, don't let those guys that are tempted want to come up to me so that they wouldn't perish. And he instructed further, we see now in Romans 5, 9, where it says much more than having now been justified by his blood. This is something that is really important. When we have this faith message that we share, it's not faith in our faith. In order for God to be appeased, because it's his wrath that you and I are spared from, not from Satan, we just get to join him. 
The enemy that we have is we are the enemies of God unless we submit and are born again. God has no rivals that could contest him. Not, the, Satan is not even remotely close in power or anything like that. He is not a God in God's category that he can be trifled with. So it is God alone that we are actually being saved from his wrath and he has put forth the price necessary to be met in a debt that is not his for us to be restored to him. Which is what Romans 5.9 says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So when we would say, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, it is acknowledging that Jesus Christ died, he was born, and he died, and that the price that he paid was to appease the Father, that he's seated at the right hand side, and he's the true Son of God. There is an act through that faith that God acknowledges because he can discern to the depths of a man's heart, which you and I can't do, and he goes, you're justified. So when you think now of the birth of Christ, know this, that it was a historically significant event for all of mankind everywhere. And we are journeying out together, John 3, 16, 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. The river, going off already, but for Christ. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So therein lies, when we would think again that Jesus, eh, born, his ministry only started you see, we, we focus on the works. We forget the significance of the works meant nothing because it is not the works, it's the obedience. It's the son coming. It's the son serving the father. The son is now seated at the right-hand side of the father as a result. Regardless of man's shortfall, God put into motion redemption for us. Closing with us, Galatians 1, 3 to 5. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So consider that as you're going from celebrating Christmas into the the closing of this year, that for each and every one of us, to commit to God again and be renewed and be refreshed in him for the price for our restoration back to him was great, but we're moving into a season where I believe that God is wanting to bring in the harvest ever more so. And so he's looking for the faithful workers that are the primary beneficiaries of the gospel we proclaim. Amen. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being able to gather in your name and we celebrate your birth. We celebrate the beginning of what you had decided to come into the physical to restore us spiritually back to you. We thank you, Jesus, for that price that you paid. We thank you, Father, for your incredible love for us being on display through your son's surrender on the cross. And we thank you that every and all judgment, past, present, and future, was exacted on your son in full that not a measure of wrath that should have been poured out for us to be saved, for those still to be saved, that, Father, not a single one was not judged so that you might be glorified and that we have this amazing privilege through that to be able to receive the free gift to be reconciled and restored to you. And so, Jesus, I, I praise your beautiful name for this amazing privilege that we would be able to herald it, Receive it and enjoy you in Jesus' name. Amen.